are you and why are you here and what are you excited about? Well, I am excited about the potential to, for technology to enable humans. So I, I was one of the very first class of students in the business faculty at University of Alberta way back before many of you were born uh, that had to take a computers course. And unlike most of my classmates, I was actually really excited about that um, because I saw this incredible potential to do stuff. And so I've worked in, in this field of trying to blend humans and technology really for quite a long time, put my first website up in 1984, which, or sorry, 1994, which was about Canada's best employers for women. So it was blending the people and technology even then. Thanks to technology and thanks to the internet, all of the businesses in this room and in this province are facing more competition than they ever have before. Um, I, you know, unless you're the local dry cleaner, you've got global competitors now. Any innovative technological idea you come up with can and will be copied if it's any good, and it can be copied very, very quickly. And so, ultimately, the conclusion that I've come to and the people I've spoken to have come to is that the human element and getting that part right, and in particular getting customer experience right, is the one way that you have to really differentiate what it is that you're doing. Because uh, to be honest, I mean, customer experience and the human elements of it, it's not easy to get it right. But I really believe that that is the one magical element that can help an organization survive and it gives you an incredible defense against competitors and, and people who are copying what you do. biggest barrier, honestly, is fear. I think people are really afraid of what technology can do. And in some instances, I suppose, with good reason. I mean, right now, all those people who are working McJobs, the, right now McDonald's has the capability of running a McDonald's outlet completely without people. And it does a better job than it does with people. Faster, more reliable, more accurate. So there are huge swaths of the economy that will change radically. And we don't yet know exactly how to deal with the fact that a lot of the people in those jobs may not be ideally suited to taking on knowledge work, uh, taking on other types of work. So I think that's a big barrier for general public acceptance. In terms of business, I think big barriers have to do with just the pace of change and businesses feel really overwhelmed. And you know, when you're an entrepreneur and you've got to make these expensive technology decisions and you're not the technologist, who do you believe? I mean, probably everybody, well, maybe not in this room because there are a lot of tech people, but you know, the typical audiences I speak to, everybody in there has been burned by a bad website development at some point or another. So they don't really know who, who they can trust. And then finally, I, I think the um, final barrier is simply, and it's not a barrier, but it's, it's a factor that needs to be contended with, is we do have a strong desire for human contact. I mean, people pay tons of money to go to a concert at, with lousy sound quality because they want that human interaction. So I don't see that as a barrier, but I, I think that that is a key part that has to be taken into account in moving forward. The mistake that I see a lot of organizations make is they strictly look at what will make their processes faster and more efficient, but they don't look at where's the value coming in for the customer. And this is where tools like customer journey mapping really need to be your starting place. You need to start with what is the customer looking for and what is their experience from the time they start thinking they might need something like what we offer, right through to the point of learning about it, contacting your organization, buying from you and beyond. You really need to look at that first and then map that back to your processes and how we can make those processes more effective, more efficient. 
But in terms of, you know, actual examples, one, I, my book, at the back of the room, People Shock, has lots of examples, but one that comes to mind, for instance, um, there's a company called Frank and Oak. I don't know if anyone here buys from Frank and Oak. Um, they're based out of Montreal, and they started selling clothes to men and style to men. And what they do, their business model, is they basically ship you a package that has new clothes in it every month, and and there's no charge for the, the shipping cost. And then you can try it on. Whatever you don't like, you can ship back free. Now, you'd think, this has got to be horrendously expensive as a business model. But they've married it with the technology and with sophisticated predictive analytics so that they've got a really good hit rate and very little stuff actually has to be returned. That said, they also, like many of the pure play online retailers, have decided recently that they wanted to open a few shops so they could get in closer touch with their customers, understand them better. But even there, they did what any retailer really needs to do now if they want to survive, which is they made the shops an experience in and of themselves. So, for instance, in their Edmonton store, they've got a Prohibition-era style barber shop in there. They want to make it about men and grooming, and, but also about fun, having some purpose for coming. From my perspective, I would say the biggest takeaway is to recognize that the human element is, in fact, your only way to stand out in a sea of sameness. That is the key potential competitive advantage that you have, and that you should be using technology and systems and processes to support the people, both inside your organization and outside your organization. I also think it's really important that organizations un do more listening and deeper understanding of the people that they mean to serve, uh, including their employees, but also all the range of people outside, which includes not just customers and potential customers, but your lenders, your suppliers, your distributors. Like, if you don't have good people relationships in all of those places, too, that can also put you under, right? And then finally, to focus on what I call in the book the three P's of profit, which are promise, people, and process. So understand why you're doing what you're doing, the promise, the people I've talked ad nauseum about, and then the process, which is where a lot of organizations fall down. They don't re-examine their processes from the perspective of how can we do things better, how can we serve people better.